Hey, Mike Rain here with Canadian Musician Magazine. And this is a pretty unique uh, day for me, at least. Um, viewers of our videos, listeners of our podcast, readers of our magazine, be familiar with our usual sit-down interviews. This is going to be a bit of a different one. As you can see, two folks here with me. The one and only Stephen Fearing, a renowned Canadian singer-songwriter, one-third of uh, all-country supergroup Blackie and Rodeo Kings, guitarist extraordinaire, and beside him, Linda Manzer, um, guitar maker extraordinaire, one of the most renowned uh, luthiers here in Canada. And the reason they are here today is to reveal, well, and we're certainly going to get into details of it, but the new cowpoke that uh -huh. Linda has made specifically for Stephen. Um, guys, I'm not even sure to where to start with this cool story, <laughs> but let's, let's go back to the start of the new guitar and let's then tie it into the old one sure. and go back to the start of your relationship. But first, just tell me why we're here today in terms of what's going on with this new guitar that Stephen, you've just in the last couple hours, I believe, have seen for the first time, eh? That's correct. I, I saw it, what, three hours ago for the yeah. first time, two hours? So I've owned this guitar for 30 years. And Linda made it for me in this shop, and uh, I've played it since the day I got it, uh, almost every day of my life. And I've recorded all my albums pretty much on it and played all my concerts on it. And, and so at some point, I mean, it's still in great shape. It's still like, it's a seriously heavy duty, rockin' pro professional guitar. But I had a guitar, uh, this guitar uh, got lost by one of the airlines. <laughs> we could leave it there. And, Do you care to call them out right now? Oh, <laughs> uh, it was Air Canada, but you know, they all lose them. Like I've, I've, I've had them all lose them. What, what? What was terrifying was that nobody knew where it was. And this was uh, this went on for three days. So it ended up going from me being frustrated um, and, and firing off a Facebook post to being on the 6 o'clock news. And the headlines in some of the papers were, Musician Fights Twitter War. Like, it must have been a slow news day in Canada. I mean, really, 6 o'clock news? But Linda told me later that she quietly went, oh, okay, I better start making and starting start the process because she and I have been talking about another guitar for a fair fair period of time and trying to figure out for me how I could afford to do this because when I bought this guitar it was $2,900 which was a king's ransom for me back in 30 years ago mm -hmm. and you know that's that's the kind of guitars that Linda makes mm -hmm. right it's not a budget guitar this is like a for the rest of your life guitar and so it's a basically a conversation that we have been having off and on the catalyst for starting the guitar unbeknownst to me was was air canada um yeah, screwing up. And, thank you, Air yeah, Canada. You. <laughs> I, that's it's my it, of point course. of view. First time those words have ever been said. <laughs> well, they actually did let me get on a plane yesterday with my guitar and didn't. Oh, yeah. yeah, so I'm but actually pretty happy about that. I think they've. I think they're all having to look at it a bit different. Anyway, the guitar came back, and it was actually hand delivered to me by an Air Canada employee, okay. and they basically said, "Would you please stop now, sir?" <laughs> <laughs> because anyway, so. <laughs> Fast forward, I don't quite have the chronology exact, but um, I'll try and keep this story as, as quick as I can. But I had a fan slash friend, he became a friend, named Jerry Hayes. And Jerry Hayes, this was Jerry's guitar. And Jerry met me at a, a, at a gig, and we got to yakking, and he said, Oh, I've got a Manzer. And I was like, oh, really? Because there's always this sort of thing. When, when you run into another man's or owner, there's a bit of a, a checking out and a, hey, how are you? And we're in the club. And there's Is there a not... secret handshake that <laughs> I should know about? <laughs> not that I know of, but there aren't that many of us. You know, it's not like I own a Gibson or something. Yeah. You know, it's... And so Jerry brought that guitar to a couple of gigs over the years because I was living in Guelph. I live out in Victoria now. We took pictures of the two of them side by side. This is an 89, I got it in 1990, that's a 79. So that's actually, and if you notice the, the, uh, the cutaways are different. The headstocks are similar, they're clearly cousins, but to my way of thinking, this is closer to a Larabee, which is, I mean, I'm talking as if Linda's not here. She can tell you all about that. But anyway, um, eventually Jerry said, I want you to have the guitar. He came to a gig and said, I want you to have it. And I was kind of blown away and I very politely refused because, to me, there's a big 
kind of a karmic thing around somebody giving you a guitar. And I've been given a couple of guitars in my life, and there's always this thing around it that is, it's lovely, it's fantastic, it's a, it's a most beautiful thing. I think giving somebody an instrument is one of the most beautiful things you can do. But I couldn't take it from him because look at it, that guitar is 40 years old. Yeah. And this guitar is 30 years old. Now, do you see a difference? Yes. This one is beat to shit. It's got scratches and dings. And that's what happens when you play an instrument and you love it so much and you make bad decisions with preamps. And, <laughs> right? So I said, Jerry, this has been your baby. You give this to me, it's going to get lost and it's going to get broken and, and, and spit on and all these things. And so... In a good he, way. He, yeah, in a good way. He took it away. Mm -hmm. Apparently never played it again. It sat on a stand like that, and uh, apparently he called it Stephen's guitar. And wow. Jerry passed away a couple of years later, and his widow Diane phoned me and said, come get your guitar. It was, it was always yours, yeah. so now you just get to have it. And so I took the guitar home, and I played it, and I felt like there was something not quite right. And it, indeed, it needed a neck reset, which is not uncommon with a guitar of that age. Mm -hmm. But it hadn't had a neck reset. And instead, they had shaved down the, uh, the, the saddle. And um, so it needed that kind of work. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to put $2,000 worth of work into a guitar that I might not play. Mm -hmm. Because you can't. The deal with a guitar is, is that if it's, it's not a conscious thing. You can't make yourself love a guitar. Mm -hmm. You either like it or you don't. Mm -hmm. And that's it. And so for me to have a guitar that was given to me in such a lovely way by such a lovely man and then not play it just didn't feel right. So I gave it to Linda and Tony to do some, you know, to do these repairs on. And we discussed what the options were. And Linda said, you know what? Why don't you let me have that guitar mm -hmm. and I'll build you a new guitar. Mm -hmm. And, and then, you know, then basically this rare guitar, because it is really rare, because she doesn't make them with those cutaways anymore. And this is, it's, it's actually quite an amazing guitar. But I wanted one of these, because this is a bigger body. It's, um, it's, it's a different guitar. And this is what I played for 30 years. And so it was like, if I'm going to have another man's, or I want another one of those. Because I want a guitar that when this guitar... <laughs> needs to, you know, be on the couch a little more. Um, I want its its younger sibling to step up. I don't want a different guitar because then it's like, well, I'm going to bring two guitars. No, I, this is the guitar for me mm -hmm. for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. So I just want one that can step into its shoes when that time comes. Be that in a year's time or in five years' time, I'm not sure. But so that's how we got from that guitar, from this guitar to that guitar to this guitar. And this is... This is the replacement. This is the new one. This is not the replacement. Excuse me. This is the uh, <laughs> the sister, and it's um that's the story. <laughs> With that, I think it's important to provide some context on why having a guitar from Linda is so important or so special. Um, I really didn't do it justice in the intro to this interview and talking about Linda's history. You've built guitars for Paul Simon, Gordon Lightfoot's, um, uh, Ed Robertson's, Carlos Santana. Like, it's incredible. You have a long history in the business. You were protege of Jean Larivet, or at least worked uh, under Jean Larivet for a long time. But Linda, do you mind just giving me the Coles Notes version of your history of guitar? Entire history of Coles no, Notes? The, 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 the first paragraph of Wikipedia entry version of it or whatever, but I just want, I just want to give people a, the context and why having you build a guitar is so special for someone. Um, I studied with Jean-Claude Larivet for three and a half years, and I also studied archtop guitar building with James D'Aquisto. Um, uh, I, <laughs> sorry, just well, like I'm getting uh, tongue tied. How, how, first, out of curiosity, how did you get into being a luthier in the first place? Like, well, what, what went, brought you to this? I went to see Joni Mitchell performing at Mariposa Folk Festival. Excellent. And she had a dulcimer, yeah. and I went to buy one because I wanted to be kind of a little mini version of Joni Mitchell folk singing. And so I went to the Toronto Folklore Center to buy one, and it was $150, and I didn't have that. So I, I was talked into buying a kit for half the price. So I went home and assembled it. I actually didn't think I could do it. The guy talked me into doing it, yeah. and uh, I'm very grateful he did. And then I, I got to experience the joy of what it's like to assemble something, string it up, and bring it to life musically. And the bug bit. I was a teenager and 
And then I went to art college. I didn't kind of realize I was supposed to be a guitar maker for a few years. So I fumbled around in two different art colleges. And then I ended up begging Jean Larrave <laughs> to hire me. And he didn't really want to because yeah. he wasn't, well, part of it was because he wasn't hiring people. Also, he didn't really want to hire a woman. Oh, okay. But um, I, I uh, <laughs> he said to me at the time, he said, well, I'm a male chauvinist. And I said, and I could hear his wife laughing in the background. I thought, you know, okay, can't be that bad. And I said, I don't care if you don't care. And <laughs> so it kind of ended up being like amazing because he, he wasn't a male chauvinist. He was many things, but he wasn't a male chauvinist. And he was an amazing teacher. And I was very lucky to work with him for three and a half years. When did you strike it on your own? And how did you build the reputation where people like Stephen, Bruce Coburn, Goran Lightfoot, Paul Simon, like, you know, these legends here and abroad are coming to you and saying, build me a custom guitar. Like, <laughs> I, I honestly, just like, how does that happen? Well, I got, I guess I got lucky because I, um, the one of the first people who actually I, I was commissioned to build a guitar for was Carlos Santana. Oh, so that's I, the way to start. yeah, that's, <laughs> our, yeah, no, no pressure. And uh, I actually probably was too, you know, naive to realize yeah. how challenging it was, but um, he liked it. Uh, he, he talked about it in a magazine and, um, the person who I've actually worked with the most over the years is Pat Matheny, yeah. and I built him over 25 guitars and mm -hmm. and uh, including that iconic 20. one that I don't even really know how to describe. Yeah, the Picasso, <laughs> yeah. the 42 string Picasso yeah. guitar, <laughs> and then uh, I've worked with uh, Bruce Coburn as well. Um, and you know, when you work with people like that, they they're fussy, mm -hmm. and you gotta have your chops together. You gotta mm -hmm. listen to them. You gotta be, you know, get inside their head um, and try to figure out what they want exactly and really listen to what they're telling you and do your best work. Mm -hmm. And um, it, yeah, it's a little scary. Mm. Oh, it's a little scary. Am I fussy enough? Yeah, oh no, no, I'm well, not uh, as fussy as Pat Matheny. I'll bet. Uh, you're fussy in a different way. Okay. In a good way. Good way, Stephen. Good way, Stephen. <laughs> but no, I like the challenge though yeah. because you, you know, you like I'm terrified building everybody a guitar. To be honest, everybody thinks, oh, I just crank them out, but. Mm -hmm. I'm terrified. I like, I'm terrified right now because well, I, I just understand. got this. And, I know, I know. I don't totally understand. Well, I'm, I'm just putting a new record out and I feel the same way. And people go, oh, for God's sake, man. Really? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's that thing of creating something and then it's done. And it's no longer, you don't have any control over it anymore. And you, you can't do anything more. You let your, it go. Your little heart on yeah, your sleeve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I could yeah. come along and do that. Yeah. yeah. I won't. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know what you mean. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. Whew. Before we jump to the new guitar, a support, a support group for each other. I love your new album that you haven't made yet. <laughs> Before we jump to the making of the new guitar, just first to go back to the original Cowpoke made in 1989. Um, it was a great story, but you didn't say first how you got it. Was it custom to you? And how well, did you two come together? Well, the, the way uh, Willie P. Bennett, my, my dear friend, my old um, mentor, the reason we started Blackie and the Rodeo Kings, Willie P. Bennett, uh, Canadian songwriter who flew under the radar a lot, but uh, a really great guy. Um, he and I became friends. And that's a whole other story. But he he was very supportive of young players. And so he basically said, you know, whenever you're in Toronto, here's the front door key. That's where the linen is kept. You don't have to call. Just let yourself in, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. So I slept on Willie's couch for years. And around about the same time, um, I started working. Well, no, that's later. But anyway, I had a Guild D35, which is a, a very good factory-made you know, Guild, mm -hmm. Gibson, they, all those companies are kind of large entities. And I sort of imagine that there's like a bin of necks and net backs and somebody just walks around and gets all the parts and assembles them and spray finishes and out the door and, you know, they crank them out. I got a good one. I loved it. Mm -hmm. And it had a flaw, though, in the neck. Somewhere in the grain on the neck, there was a flaw. And so the neck started to pull up. And I ended up playing it with a capo on to try and hold the strings down. And, and it was clearly on its way out. Yeah. So I had to find an alternative. And I called Willie and he took me around the city. We went to pawn shops. We went to guitar stores and a couple of builders. And then he said, there's this woman named Linda Manzer. She's got a shop in Cabbage Town. So we called Linda and she said, well, my waiting list is, I don't know, it was four months, five months then. I can't remember. What is it now? Four, four months, five months. 
I thought you were into years no. at this point. Okay, no, no. okay. So I've got a very short waiting list. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and she said, "Well, I don't, I don't have anything for you this, to play." There might. You said there was one in a pawn shop. I remember you saying, "There's one in a pawn shop up the road," <laughs> and I, and then wow. you sort of paused and went, "Well, actually, there is one here that you could play." And then if you like it, you know, I can make one for you. So we came over, and I sat in that room, uh, and Willie kind of wandered about. I think he went for a coffee or something, because I was, as I recall, I was here for three hours playing this guitar. And it was like, I don't want to be on your waiting list. I want this guitar. And I couldn't figure out if Linda had, was keeping it for herself <laughs> or what the deal was. But basically, it was, how can I get this guitar? Sorry. And... Um, you know, we figured it out. Linda basically made it possible for me to have it by letting me pay her slowly, which was very generous of her. And because, you know, I wanted you 2900 <laughs> bucks was a lot of money for a, a young singer-songwriter who was graduating from a, a guild factory made to a hand-built Canadian guitar. So that was when our friendship started. And over the years, you know, things need to be done, a different truss rod, a couple of things that gets cracked. Yeah. Uh, you know, stuff happens, and so it comes home yeah. to be fixed up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And um, so we've, you know, we've been pals for for a, quite some time. Helped each other through a couple of life's ups and downs. Now he's you know? talking about the guitar, not him <laughs> and me. <laughs> but you know, it's 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 just it's such a, a strange. Like I, honestly, I don't see Linda that often. Sometimes it'll be two, three years, four years. And then we might call her up and say, hey, I got this issue going on or something. You call me up in, in a disguised voice. <laughs> oh, yes, I do that. <laughs> I like to call her up and pretend that I want some kind of like four-necked ukulele or something. In an accent, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> but, and yet, every day of my professional life, I mean, there's, there's probably maybe in a year there'll be a period of a, of a week or two where I don't play this. Yeah. But it's, it's pretty much every week if not every day, <laughs> you know, most, and, and when I'm touring, it's every day. Yeah. And then I'll go home for a week, and then I'll go back out for a week, and home for a week. And I have spent more time with this. This is like, I've been married, uh, I've been in three different relationships, <laughs> married twice <laughs> since I, like, you know what I mean? That, that's, that's quite a strong connection. And, and so the person that makes this guitar, without really intending to, or without knowing it, they, they profoundly affect your life. Like, on a kind of a, a basic, this is the quality of life sort of level. Because my whole career has been built around this guitar. Wow. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Wow, wow. I know, but it's yeah. true. I put a spell on yeah. you. <laughs> I know. Yeah, if it gets too heavy, just bring Tony in because he can leaven, <laughs> yeah, lighten yeah. things up. But you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, 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 an, it's, a, it's really an intense kind of thing. Was it? <laughs> it's not a Gibson. It's not a guild where it's like, well, it's a Gibson. So that you know, there's this big factory. It's this. Yeah, it's just me. It's this space <laughs> and her. It's just me. Yeah. 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 But you know, as your career progressed, both as a solo artist and certainly Blackie and Rodeo Kings, surely you got to the point where you could have had your pick of guitars, whether it was the custom shop, Gibsons <laughs> and Fenders, or another, you know, boutique luthier or whatever. Um, you know. You you progressed past where you were in 1989. So what kept you, whether whether it was a sentimental attachment or oh, no, the tone, no, 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 what, what 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 kept you? It's it's not, it's just that the, this is like it's like, it's when I went from the guild to this, um, it was like going from a Ford to a, a Lamborghini or something. I, I I can't really the metaphor doesn't work, but it's it's it there, for me. there's there's <laughs> like there's no you you don't. It, there are beautiful, it's not like every guitar that is a good guitar has to be a handmade guitar because I've played Martins from the 50s that are just, they're unbelievable yeah. things. But they don't do, some of them are like one trick ponies in that if you want to record, this guitar is great. Mm. Um, if you want to do this, this guitar. But this guitar is, I play solo and, and it has to cover a lot of ground. Mm -hmm. It has to be able to be very rhythmic and driving. It has to be something that I can pick really quietly and, and still speak. Um, it has to have a, a pretty wide sonic range from bass to treble and, and even thing, and all of this stuff. And it has to be reliable and roadworthy. Mm -hmm. So that's, there's, it's, it's not like when I got better, I could have moved to better. This is it. Mm -hmm. This is the better. There's, and so for me, it's just if you wanted a different flavor. Mm -hmm. And, eh, you know, 
yeah, I'd love to own one of those Martins from the 50s. And my friend has got me on the list. I'm like 15th on the list. Um, but I would never, I mean, I, I don't travel with two guitars, really. I travel with one and a suitcase and some pedals, and that's it. That's, that's, I got to keep it as simple as I can because mostly I'm on my own. Mm -hmm. So I need one guitar that will do it all. One guitar to rule them all, <laughs> and this is it. So, yeah. So... Bring it. Maybe you want to grab the new one there to uh, that will show off. But so you told the story of why it came time for the new one. I tried to grab it back. Oh <laughs> yes. I keep forgetting that you're good with guitars. <laughs> well, I don't, <laughs> you don't know if need I'm a good, roadie. but here they are. <laughs> so, Linda, when it came time to build the new one, and maybe this is a question for both of you, was the idea is like, are you building an exact replica of the old one, or are you saying, all right, I want I, w I want a new version of what I have, but here's how we could tweak it. Did it fall somewhere in between that? Um, you, you talk. Well, okay, I'll talk. <laughs> um, if I'd had his guitar with me, I might have tried to make it spec-wise more identical, exactly. but I didn't have it with me. Right. So what I did was I just figured after 30 years, I've made some improvements, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just, uh, for instance, this guitar has a wedge, which mm -hmm. the other one didn't have, which means it's skinnier on the underneath your shoulder mm -hmm. and wider on your knee so, so it here is skinnier than here yeah which i don't know if the camera can pick it up but it's it's definitely different so the idea is well you keep talking i'll okay. just no, that's i'll okay. be the model okay <laughs> um so i i i kind of go by instinct and mm -hmm. vibe so what i did was it, it's actually more dangerous if i just tried to technically duplicate it. Mm -hmm. So what I tried to do was I, I had the parameter of it being that size guitar, which is called the Cowpoke, yeah. and you won't let me change the name. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and then from there, I just added the wedge and just used the best woods I could and and, and used my instinct to make it as lively and alive as, as possible. It will be quieter than his other one to mm -hmm. start. It'll have a slightly different tone, but as, to, uh, as he's, you know, you're playing it in, it's yeah, gonna... Yeah. Time will, you know, time will improve it. And when I got this one, um, I didn't have the luxury of breaking it in, because the old guild was. Yeah. So I, uh, I basically put a pickup in it, and I've had a few since. Um, but, but it went on the road right away, and the sound changed. Mm -hmm. It changed immediately, like there was this huge change. And then over the course of a couple of years, it changed. But it changes every season too, which is. It's like a pendulum. As it gets older, I find that it tends to sit in the sweet spot longer. Oh, but okay. when they were when it was younger, it would go through these seasonal changes where not only would it get hard to play because the neck would sw the body would swell and I'd have to bring it in and get it adjusted, which s still happens, but it would sound there was always points in the summer especially Ontario summers where it's so humid yeah. where they just sound kind of like cardboard like they're super saturated and then in the winter you know I've got two humidifiers in this guitar now when at all times mm -hmm. but I you know you, you you're home for two weeks mm -hmm. you forget mm -hmm. you pull it out of the case and it's like oh the humidifier is completely dry because you got forced air in your house and the guitar doesn't sound that great mm -hmm. and you gotta kind of sorry 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 <laughs> humidify humidify or you go play a gig in Banff yeah. and everything just goes to hell like it's you know they're they are living things uh, same with my voice you go hang out in Banff for, th for three days and then it's it's hard to sing Guitars, the same it's so thing. dry? Yeah. Oh. It's right. so dry. And same with the guitars. So they, you know, they, they, they fluctuate, yeah. but from brand new to, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know how long a guitar like this goes. So I was playing those Martins from the 50s. Sometimes I don't think those guitars get played for three months at a, at a go. Mm -hmm. So does a guitar that gets played every day or every week at least... How long does it last? I don't know, but I do know that this has gotten better and better and better. And right now, it sounds fucking awesome. So it's going to take a while for this one to catch up. To yeah. catch up. yeah. It, it's not going to be like, oh, well, that's it. I got the new guitar. That one goes in the case. You know, this one comes on the road with me. And that, this is going to stay at home, and I'm going to play it and, and just let it wake up. Yeah. What tone wood is used on this guitar? That's uh, the back and sides are Indian rosewood. The top is a European spruce top, and the uh, neck is mahogany, and the 
fingerboard and bridger ebony. Are those your preferences or just specifically for this style of guitar? That's my preference for my flat top guitars. Okay. Uh, I, I, you know, it's not that they're particularly better woods. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, I, I mean, I think they are the best woods, but, but there's certainly other woods that are great. But I'm used to working with these particular woods. Okay. So over the years, I've just gotten a sense of how to direct them. Mm-hmm. And if I started playing around with new woods, I wouldn't be as familiar with them. So. Okay. Throughout the course of making this, like, are you checking in on it? Do you have any assurance that, you know, you, I guess by the time you're handing it off, you kind of better be happy with it. But like, is there any assurances in the making process? Well, that- there was, I mean, the way I looked at it and, and Linda and I talked about it a little bit when, when it was like, hey, you know what? I'm going to make a new guitar. We're, we've, we've made this whole conversation happen and the transition to Jerry's guitar has happened. And it's like one thing I've learned in the studio is that every time I've had a drummer in who, I, you know, it's like Gary Craig or, or you name it, a, a, a really like great drummer in, and I've got this idea for a drum groove and I try, so you, you play your hi-hat and do this, and they go, oh, like this, and they play it, and it never works. Mm-hmm. It's like if I shut up and I let them, I play them the song, and then they play the groove that they hear, it's not 100 times out of 100, it's better. And so for me, it's like, why would I tell Linda Mance what to do? I tell her I like this style of guitar because I do. The rest of it is up to her. You know, if she wants to put a wedge on it or she, like the, the fretboard's got an extra fret. Cool. <laughs> she decided to put this slight sunburst, honey burst around it. Great. Like, I'm, this is my new guitar. I'm going to play this and it's going to take me in whatever direction it takes me and I'm very interested to... The only thing we really did discuss is um, my signature. Because originally I wanted, you know, SF or Stephen Fearing or something. And it would, like, Stephen Fearing is a lot of letters. So, mm-hmm. Stephen Fearing. It would have like, like, <laughs> been a, a G up here. Nashville. Yeah, it would have looked really bad. So, and then I thought just, uh, uh, like, SF here. And she said, well, what about your signature? Looks great. That's cool. Oh, and it's she cut it out of Mother of Pearl. Mm, well, good timing you said that. This is what I cut it out of. Which is extremely brittle. Yeah. And ridiculously. You don't and breathe she cut when you're cutting that it. You out just... of that. <laughs> and then then what you put it on and you trace it and then you route out the wood and then yeah. you drop it in with super glue or yeah, something? With like uh, epoxy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's and awesome. It, it, this is very thin too. It's like a one and a half, two millimeters thick, and the the cur the fingerboard curves. It's got about oh a twelve God, right? twelve foot radius or twelve inch radius, and so you have to just like get it so it just doesn't submerge, so and doesn't bend. And then you smooth it off. You smooth it off. Yeah, it's gorgeous. It's great. Also, I'd like to give Tony Duggan Smith credit for doing the fretting work on uh-huh. the guitar because I I do fret, but Tony frets amazingly so i bring tony in to fret all my guitars. when he has worked on this one a number of times and fixed it up for me uh, so yeah. he's yeah so it's it's a uh, yeah so wow. it it is this is it's yeah it i can't i can't imagine maybe someday i'll have the the luxury of saying all right i want a guitar that's made with this and this and this and this. but then if it comes home and you don't like it and it's like well that was dumb yeah <laughs> Better to just say, I love this style of guitar. This is what I do. And and Linda's seen me play a bunch. She's she's watched me wiggle the necks. She knows what I do with them. And she's seen this one come in with cracks and finish worn away. So, you know, she knows what I do. So she's not going to make me a guitar that's not going to put up with that. Right? <laughs> well, no. <laughs> <laughs> and if you know, I I want you to be happy. So yeah. like I'm uh, nervous as a, a you know as a kitten. If kittens are nervous, yeah. I don't know. But when I'm when I'm building and it, when you're picking it up, because you know there is a kind of a a question of you know when I'm building, I don't know exactly what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's you know I have questions or, and I I I I have some as a lot of expertise. But there is the wood factor, which is the the question mark of what's going to happen once you put all the strings on and they start vibrating. It's mm. wood. It's a natural material. Mm. And I pick it as carefully as I can, mm-hmm. sonically. I always pick, I always try to make function the first thing. Yeah. And then, uh, well, the most important thing is sound. And then the second thing is function so that it, it doesn't fall apart or, mm-hmm. you know, explode when you put the strings on. <laughs> and then the third thing is how it looks. Where, out of curiosity, where do you source wood for? 
guitar building? Uh, all over the place, but uh, I get uh, I get my rosewood from gee, all over the place. I have a, I do have a supply of European sp- spruce from a guy in Germany, um, and you know you just I just buy where, whatever wood vendors. I like to pick it in person yeah. if I can. I'll go to the to the source. Like not to, I won't go to Africa and pick ebony, but uh, there's people who get it, and it's it's a uh, it's reliable sources. What are you looking for when you're just looking at slabs of wood? How do you know what makes for a good guitar wood? Um, stability. I look for wood that's not warped. I, I look for, for the top, I'm, I'm picking them up and tapping them like he just did. <laughs> um, you, you, and you flex them for flexibility. The top, I look for different things in the top than I do in the, ne- in the, in the uh, neck, for instance. The neck, I just care that it's stable. Yeah. And the... Uh, the back and sides, uh, Indian rosewood is quite a reliable type of wood. So, mm-hmm. so when, when you see someone like Stephen or Bruce Coburn or whoever it may be playing one of your guitars in front of a crowd or you're listening to an album and you know it's your guitar that, mm-hmm. that you're hearing, just what's that like for you? It's really exciting and emotional mm-hmm. and terrifying. Um, <laughs> at the same time, because if anything happens, like if the string goes out of tune, I feel like it's my fault. Yeah, it's your so, fault. Yeah. I remember you were at a gig and I, I blew a string, which I used to break strings all the time, like two and three in a night. I used to change my strings every show. And uh, I remember you were in a show. And also, I, I like this thing of... I like wiggling the neck. <laughs> I, I really like that. It's and like I'm it's glad this... glad I know that. And, uh, and I, you know... Apparently, Linda was in the crowd, kind of in a fetal position, like, what are you doing? Your strings are breaking. And isn't that some guy oh. said to you, like, are you okay? And he said, I built that guitar. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was actually, it's true. I was actually at a gig. Uh, somebody was playing my guitar on the weekend. I was at a guitar show in Colorado. And he just was short, showing off the guitar. And he went up to the pickup and was playing all the way up to the, the 24th fret. And he decided to fret on the actual pole pieces of, oh. of the pickup just to show if he's like smiling. All of a sudden, as soon as he hit the 24th fret, it it cut out oh. and, and i'm i feel re- completely responsible that somehow it's my right, fault right. that what had happened is the end jack had just loosened come oh. out yeah all you do is but i was having a heart attack he's like <laughs> he's panicking and like, suddenly there's hot no sound dog. that's what you get for hot dog <laughs> exactly yeah. that was Stephen, before this gets break uh broken in and Bro- it, broken. broken in and uh yeah certainly not uh break but yeah once it's before it gets broken in and it becomes your uh your go-to just to end on a bit of looking back on the original cow poke you have is it's, there moment is there i just wanna, is there moments musically in the studio songwriting live personally just like is there a couple of moments it, that stand it, out it, to you it would be hard to find one um there have been so many over the years i mean t- for me it was really like Willie P. Ben is a friend. He's a, he was a mentor to me. And the fact that he brought me here and introduced me to this guitar and Linda, that's a pretty significant thing. But it's, it's a, maybe it's, it's been lost. It's been broken. I've, I've opened a case and found cracks from here all the way around. Like, there's so many things, but it's just, it's just this very reliable thing. It's been a very constant thing in my life. And Oh my God! I've lived. I've lived in a lot of different parts of Canada. I've you been. Get to, you can keep it. <laughs> you can keep it. <laughs> it's been very constant. So I, I don't have any one story, and it's it's really it's been the instrument that I've uh, spent my whole life playing. That's 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 sort of the story. And one more thing, I'm just remembering because you mentioned off camera that you said even the case has a cool yeah. story. Well, so just to quickly, is, uh, the case is when I got that guitar. I got a Calton case, which was being made at the time by Al Williams in, um, in Calgary. And Al had made a case for my old guilt. Mm-hmm. And then when I got this guitar, and it was only a couple of years later, I went to him and he made the case. And he shipped it out. And it's also survived 30 years. And mm-hmm. to some degree, it's been, it's the bouncer, right? It takes all of the blows and the scratches and the stickers and left in the sun, all these things. Al sold the company to a, a guy out in New Brunswick who I won't bother mentioning because he's a shyster. And he kind of drove the company into the ditch. And uh, Keith Calton, who originated the design of the case, they're fiberglass cases that are customized to your guitar. So when you get the guitar and you put it in, 
you can actually feel the air come out of the case as your guitar drops in. Mm. Yeah. The first time you have to push them in. And they, they hold your guitar completely encased in foam and, uh, and then there's fiberglass and metal on the outside. So um, I, found, I heard that some of this guy who had driven the whole company into the ditch, after the dust settled and a new company emerged in the States, Carlton is now based out of Austin, Texas. Some of his ex-employees had fired up again. And for us in Canada who own Carlton cases, I have four of them. For me to get them repaired by sending them down to Austin, it's just not really feasible. Because you want to have, it's like, I've got two weeks before I go back on the road. My case just got wrecked. I got to get it repaired. Ship it to Austin. Deal with customs. Like, I don't think so. So I sent my case to the guys that had resurrected under the name Main Stage. And I asked them if they would refurbish my case. And they did a good job. So I said, hey. I'm getting this guitar made. It's my 30-year anniversary of this guitar. Linda Manns, a legendary Canadian builder. Me, how about a Canadian case? Do you want to? And they said, yeah, we're in. So they built me a case for this. A beautiful case. A really beautiful case. And I'm hoping that it's the start of kind of bringing back some uh, uh, integrity to the, what what was a pretty sad story. Because Carlton cases, I mean... They were the case. They were all over the world. People were, you go to any festival and there's Carlton cases everywhere you look. And they, they, well, that was started in Canada. I mean, Keith Carlton from England invented the case, but Al took it and made it a world beater. And, you know, it's a beautiful case, beautiful company, really well run, and then right in the ditch. So I hope that this is a way for it to become something because it's, it's, it's awesome to have that in our country. It's really significant. So... I hope there's a long 30 year or more history to the new guitar. Guys, thank you for having me for this conversation. Linda, for having us in your Thanks. workshop here. It's really quite cool to be it's here. A pleasure to have you here. And uh, do you mind? Uh, can we get the story started on the new one? Would you mind playing us, uh, no, playing us a little bit? I have no idea what to play, but I'll just. All right. Let you hear it. I'm just going to uh, unplug this mic and we'll get set up and have you play a quick tune. Okay, cool. The world is crying Breaks my heart in two There's no one is an island Better walk in someone else's shoes Cause we don't really see each other Trust the truth is the old divine. 